Aloha and welcome to another edition of Condo Insider. I'm Richard Emery, your host today. Let me be uh, one of many to wish you all a happy holidays. Our show is about association living in Hawaii. We bring interesting topics on the challenges and opportunities for associations, its board members, and its owners. One of the things I've heard about for years, and it's a little quieter right now because electricity costs and other utility costs have gone down, has been the value and the opportunity to submeter so that if you're in an association that uh, does not have submeters and you want the owners who use the electricity to pay for it, are there opportunities that are affordable and meaningful and accurate to do submetering? So I invited today Tyler Law, the manager in Hawaii for multifamily utility company, to come and talk to us about the new innovations and in, uh, meter reading and also uh, some of the challenges for that particular process. So Tyler, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'd like you to maybe share a little like we do with all of our guests about your background and how you got to Hawaii, how long you've been here, and, okay. and, and, and tell us about yourself. Sure. Uh, I moved to Hawaii in 2006, about a year after I graduated high school from Southern Maryland. Uh, I've been here since then, and I've worked in a number of fields. Went to UH uh, Manoa for molecular biology, and then I kind of uh, fell backwards into a job to do submetering about five years ago, and I've been doing it since. And do you like it? Yeah. Um, it's a lot of fun, and there's, as you I'm sure you know, the condo land is never boring, and so you're always meeting interesting people, interesting problems, and having to find creative solutions uh, to meet them all the time. And you work for multifamily utility company. Tell us about them. Yes, uh, multifamily utility is one of the industry leaders for uh, utility submetering in the nation. Our headquarters is in San Diego, but we've had a local office here on Bishop Street uh, for about the last seven or eight years. Um, we've been growing steadily over the past few years, uh, but we have clients in over 45 states. Uh, and we have offices on the East Coast, San Diego, and here. And you do have the local presence with your service and your local people then too. Yeah. Because that's always the big issue, the time zones and the problems, understanding our culture. So. No, that's been very important to the company. Um, even our, our CEO set up the office here to be completely independent. So we have all of our customer service, all of our billing, and all of our account management staff on island. So when we think about submetering, more often than not we're thinking electricity. Yes. But is, your, is that only what your company does or do you have other types of like water and other types of submetering you offer? So in Hawaii, we do majority electric submetering because uh, Hawaii has the highest electric utility rates on average um, compared to the rest of the country. But we also do water, which is what we've been doing a lot lately here and across the nation. But we also do gas, air conditioning, and heat, uh, even though heat isn't really a big uh, deal here in Hawaii. Well, I would say there's a lot of hot air here sometimes, <laughs> but not necessarily from the climate, you know, when we look at these things. So when you look at, uh, you see, the most common complaint I've heard, because there's some old buildings that have, yes. I'm going to call it archaic submetering technology. You know, probably before we even had cell phones, this technology yeah. was out there. And people complain that, well, my meter doesn't work, and so then they try to average the bill and, you know, um, uh, how has technology changed for uh, submeters? Let's, let's focus on your electricity since that's the big so, issue here in Hawaii. Yeah, uh, electric submeters uh, started being used in the mid 60s, and they used um, what was called power line communication back then, which was uh, later used for communications for things like elevators and pumps. And so uh, meters have kind of moved away from that and more towards more reliable and steady systems. Uh, most of the equipment that we use communicate over radio frequency. Uh, so radio bandwidths that are the same that security systems use in banks um, and other control systems that properties already have, uh, either that or through Ethernet connections. And sometimes I see uh, associations where actually there's two meters for a uh, unit. One mm -hmm. for the air conditioning and one for the basic power. Are you able to accommodate those types of things? Yep, we have one of our properties. We have water meters, air conditioning meters, and electric meters all in the same property. And so we have up to 11 meters per unit. And all of that is being collected by a single system and a single data collector and is compiled together. And is actually published onto the condo's website as well. 
And so we're able to accommodate as many meters or as few meters as a property needs. Are there ever any, like, any iPhone apps or something you can do and check on your own stuff? Or uh... One of the meters that I use does have uh, several apps that are out from the manufacturer and that they allow you to actually view your electric usage live. So you could be uh, visiting friends in Europe and you can see whether or not your kids are using the Xbox or not on your phone any time of day. Walk me through a little bit more detail what I'm going to call the technology, like yeah. what you put in the unit, how that kind of works and what it does, what it transmits to and where it goes to get to the building queues. So sure. Kind of walk me through that. So there's two general setups for a building um, for their electricity. Either the units have um, their electricity access inside the unit, so you'll have a breaker panel in your unit, or you'll have a common area panel, say in the hallway, uh, where you're able to cut off the electricity outside. So if the panel's on the inside, then where you put a meter uh, directly next to the electric panel, and then it communicates via radio frequency once a day usually, but we can actually set it up so it communicates every hour if we'd like. Um, that goes through, the, uh, through radio frequency, goes to a central data collector on property, and then that data collector collects for the entire property and then publishes those reads online where they're able to be accessed by us, by the uh, resident manager, property manager, or individual tenants and owners if they'd like. Now that particular meter you put in the unit, mm -hmm. is that big or unsightly? Is that something that's going to no. cause the unit owner to be you know, unhappy because it's, cause we all think of the normal HECO electric meter, which is quite big, right? Yeah. So, I mean, what, kind of what is this and then so, how big and how does it work? Just like um, all things computers, they've just been shrinking and shrinking over the past 30 years. Old meters were pretty large, maybe the size of a laptop or um, a magazine. Now meters are very, very small, um, half the size of like an iPhone, and that will go into a flush mount box that goes adjacent to the panel. It's um, streamlined against the drywall, so you can still hang a painting or a calendar or something over it. Um, and so that will be inset in there and then all the conduit and the electrical equipment will go inside the electric panel. So there's nothing, there's nothing unsightly that you'd see that you can't just paint over. And could an owner turn it off so they're not getting charged for electricity? Could they turn off that submeter? And they could, but it does alert us when it does that. And so then you're able to, um, I generally advocate for boards to put in some kind of uh, fee in case a unit turns off their meter inside the panel. But you would know because the technology would, uh, would, would tell you about it. Yeah, uh, we get an alert immediately and then we check with the resident manager um, or a site manager and then we're able to uh, talk to the owner directly. So kind of summarizing to get to my next point. Yeah. You put in the, the, the meter. Yes. It sends to a, it reads the, the electricity usage and it sends to a radio frequency to a server on site or to a mm -hmm. panel on site to accumulate all the data. And then from there, you know, electricity rates change, right? How does it get billed, you know? Uh, so you can have either, uh, we have multiple buildings that do it each, uh, each way. Uh, generally for us though, we read the meters each month and match those reads to your utility bill, HECO in this case. Um, and so if you're billed from the 20th of January to the 20th of February, we get your meter reads for that same period. So that way you're able to know how much everybody used and then bill them accordingly. Now, either you can have your management company just add it onto your maintenance invoice each month as a single line item, or if you're internally managed, you can send out your own invoices, or you can have a company like Multifamily actually send the invoices to the owners or tenants. And what is, what is the most prevalent way in Hawaii? What do people mostly do? Um, most people in Hawaii are, go through their management company uh, since they send out those monthly maintenance uh, statements. However, we are seeing an uptick in uh, going through a third party, so that way the management company can do what they do best, which is uh, management of the property and management of funds, and then we can do uh, every, what we do best, which is answer tenant and owner questions, um, help people reduce their usage, and then work with the owners so they can build their tenants accordingly. And probably a tough question, I'm sure there's no uniform answer. Let's just assume you have the issue of billing through the management company yep. or billing through you. Of course, sometimes owners don't pay their maintenance fees and there's, they want to file a lien and they have to foreclose and the electricity is a common expense. Mm -hmm. How do you 
make sure all the data from your side and the association side is included? Do the lawyers work with you, or, do, or does the management company come to you and say, we're going to foreclose? Do you, are they delinquent in their electricity? If they're paying you directly, mm -hmm. and, and I assume you're writing a check to the management or to the association. Mm -hmm. How, how does that all kind of sync out and work? So every month we do send in a report to the, uh, to the association as well as the management company saying who's paid, how much they've paid, and how far behind everybody else is. And so the management company is where 30 days, 60 days, 90 days out that somebody has not been paying their utility bill. And so far, 100% of the time, if they're not paying their utility bill through us, they also haven't been paying their maintenance fee for years and years and years. And so if they're... Um, the association is already taking a lien out, and so when that gets to the court, they uh, talk to us and we let them know they owe this much money. So that way the association does get all the money they're owed at the end of the day. Yeah, and, and beside the, what I call the foreclosure of the delinquent owner, you have people buy and sell property, right? Mm -hmm. And escrow is going to want to have a closing time. So do you know offhand whether they say we're going to close on this state, so read the meter on this state and tell us what they used, or do they just prorate the bill based on number of days they were there? Um, all of our meters are what we call smart meters, and so they're read on a daily basis. And so we can tell you up to the day. So if you have a tenant or if uh, a tenant move out or a sale, we can tell you up to that moment what your electricity usage is. And then we produce a final bill and distribute it. And so if you're doing the billing, mm -hmm. you're taking the period and trying to match it with HECO's period, and then you're looking what HECO charge as a rate for that particular bill. Mm -hmm. So you're applying real data of real costs and real expenses mm -hmm. against that bill you're going to bill to the owner. Yes. And so uh, the PUC, the Public Utilities Commission, is very strict on how utility billing is done, even in a sub-metering situation. And so if the property is paying, let's say, 30 cents a kilowatt hour, they can only charge their tenants up to 30 cents. They can, they can charge them 28 or 25 and give them a discount, but that's the ceiling where they have to charge. But there's probably going to always be some difference because you have the common element electricity, yep. right? Which is, even though some associations have multiple meters, more times than not, uh, uh, the common element electricity, which everybody has to pay. Mm -hmm. So it's probable that the amount you bill the residents or the owners are... Um, going to be lower than the total bill just because of the common element of electricity. For the tall condos, condominiums, where they are unable to get solar, yes, always. And, but we also do the statistical analysis to make sure that the residential percentage of the total HECO bill does fall inside of industry guidelines. Some buildings, depending on amenities, will be higher or lower. And so, not to put you on the spot, but <laughs> is there an average cost per unit to do the billing? of the of the uh, of uh, the electric meter. If you're doing no, all the work, because you have to have a stamp and an envelope and mail it, and someone's got to do the work, and someone's got to read it and take the bill and calculate it and compare it. So is there an average cost uh, or a range of costs? For a range of costs, yeah. Um, it usually ranges between 5 and $6 um, per unit per month. It depends on building size, what they want on the bill, how much work we have to do. Uh, for more complicated bills, if we're adding multiple meters, uh, there's multiple systems at the property. Some buildings will have the developer put in one system, we'll put in another, and then a third party will put in a third. And to compile all that together, that'll be, of course, a little higher. So in just general terms, a 100-unit building would be five to $600 a month, barring any complications that were, you know, really adds a lot of work to it. And the, the benefit of that, too, is if we're doing the billing and the collections, uh, in some properties we just send out the invoices, in other buildings we send out the invoices and collect the funds. Um, most of the time, we'll just uh, bill that 5 or $6 to the unit uh, specifically, so that way the AOAO doesn't have any, any out-of-pocket expenses. Oh, interesting. And so when we cut out their reimbursement check, it's able to be taken directly from that. All right. Well, we're talking with Tyler Lawl of a multifamily utility company about sub-metering. We're going to take a short break and be right back. Aloha. How you doing? Welcome to Ibachi Talk. Gordo de Texar here. We're here every Friday from 1 o'clock till about 1.45, and we talk tech with many, many great guests. So I got uh, Andrew, the security guy, who helps me co-host, and I got Poppy Chulo, who comes in once in a while to, to help us through the show. So please come join Hibachi Talk every Friday. Angus will be here, too. So remember, like we say at the end of every show, how you doing? 
Aloha. I'm State Senator Russell Ruderman. I represent the Pune and Kau District on the Big Island and the host of Ruderman Roundtable. We're here on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 2 p.m. You can join us at thinktechhawaii.com. You can find a link there to, uh, to a page where you can see past episodes. And we talk here about good government, environmental issues, and issues of the day facing the state of Hawaii. I'm Russell Ruderman. Please join us for the Ruderman Roundtable. Mahalo. Well, we're on Condo Insider. We're talking with Tyler Lull of Multifamily Utility Company about submetering of utilities. And we're talking about not just uh, electricity, but water, sewer, gas, and, and uh, I guess not sewer, but uh, water and gas, and uh, uh, about the op opportunities for boards to actually build the unit owner directly for his actual usage, recognizing that uh, common element costs are always uh, borne by the association. And when we were talking with Tyler, we were talking about the billing process, and basically you were saying there's lots of options to yep. deal with the individual needs of a building. And we were talking about maybe 5 to $6 a unit average, barring complications, hidden conditions, to do the billing, which for a 100-unit building would be five to $600. Mm -hmm. But you're doing the whole thing. You're calculating it based on the actual electricity amount. You're calculating it based on the actual owner's usage, based on the meters. How, how reliable are these meters? Uh, if they are meters that multifamilies put in, uh, they're covered by at least a 10-year warranty. And so for the first 10 years, at the very least, if a meter does act up, uh, it gets replaced almost immediately. Uh, one of the benefits for multifamily is that we actually have meter techs that are on island that are experts in these. And so we're able to not only do the billing, but identify issues and get them fixed uh, very quickly. Are you able to identify these issues even though the owner didn't complain in the sense does the technology allow you to kind of monitor the system that's working properly or? 99% um, of the time we catch the problems before the owner even notices. Uh, we'll find uh, power spikes or power drops and then we're able to go in and fix it and then we let the owner know, hey, there is this problem, it was already fixed, uh, here's your bill. So that's pretty, that's pretty solid stuff then, you know, for uh, making sure. So is this an expensive system for an association to put in? I mean, what is the, I mean, you're going to have an, a retrofit kind of building, one mm -hmm. that has the old 1960s technology versus a new building maybe coming up that the, uh, it's just too expensive to put the meters in directly. I, mm -hmm. I'm assuming you do both now. And uh, is it expensive to put in? And does it vary by whether it's a retrofit or a new building? It varies um, mostly on the electrical infrastructure of the building or the plumbing if you wanted to get water meters. Um, if you have a, the ideal situation is when you have a central panel that has individual breakers for every single unit, and then you're able to put a multimeter in that panel that's able to monitor multiple units all at one time. Uh, but no, it's not terribly expensive. And then uh, one of the big features of submetering is that you get conservation immediately. And so uh, you see your money get paid back over time. And so in a range, what do you say it is per unit to put in electrical submetering? If it's got no super hidden conditions or problematic issues, is there kind of a ballpark for our listeners that can say, this is kind of what it is? So for an easy situation, it'd be around $600 per unit. And for a more difficult, as long as it's still possible, it's around $900, $950. And that includes a rebate that's offered right now through Hawaii Energy which is $150 per unit to install meters. Now you have to go from a, what's called a master meter to submeter. And so if you already have submeters, then you don't qualify for the rebate. Now, just so I understand, the 600 to 950, whatever the number was, depending on uh, those issues, is that after the rebate or before the rebate? After the rebate, yeah. So the 600 is like 750 before the rebate, mm -hmm. you know. You see a lot of buildings doing this? We get inquiries pretty much weekly on um, retrofits. And then every time we go to a condo show or any kind of building show, uh, we get a lot of inquiries from resident managers who are seeing their common area expenses skyrocket. A lot from board treasurers who are watching their utility bill accounts and seeing them vary month to month and making it very difficult to budget um, when it comes budget time at the end of the year. Uh, so we get pretty constant inquiries in. Yeah, it seems to me that the, the logical issue is to support the concept is that the owner pays for what he uses. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and, and it's not an average or a percentage of common interest where you may have people who don't use their unit full time and those who do and have 12 kids and, and 12 air conditioners and 52 televisions and refrigerators or whatever. Exactly. Quite a bit, use quite a bit more. Right? We, we actually run into that a lot where you have one unit um, that's the same square footage as another, but one is the unit was purchased and hasn't been used in 30 years but they've paid for electricity, everyone else's electricity every month, while the neighboring unit uh, is a vacation rental that has four air conditioners, two fridges, and a wine cooler that is broken, so it's drawing a ton of electricity. Well, one of the arguments has always been that if owners know what they're paying for electricity, they'll be more conservative. Have you seen buildings save money out of this? Oh, absolutely. One of our properties uh, reduced their electric usage by, I think, 17%, um, which is over the course of one year. And so you're paying for about, um, you're saving about a fifth of your electricity costs from that year compared to the year before. And that's primarily because you change the user's habits as far as how they use electricity. Yep. You, um, a lot of time when we first put in the meters, we'll see people use uh, five, six, seven hundred dollars per month. Then after they get their first bill, that'll drop down to two or three hundred dollars. That's a good support because. Uh, um, do you, does your company provide financing for putting in these meters? Or? We do have, uh, we can do internal financing. We do have a financing partner in Hawaii. Um, it's always best for properties to purchase everything outright, but we do have multiple options for the property. And so then uh, if an owner does have concerns about their bill, I think you said you have a customer service department mm -hmm. locally here in Hawaii's time zones to take the call and try to deal with it. Yep, and then their desk is sitting right next to our tech manager, and so they're able, if the uh, owner wants to get their meter checked, our tech manager will be out there within the next day or two uh, to check the meter, to put on a check meter if they need to, uh, which is a secondary meter that verifies the first meter's readings. Um, and then since we can do daily meter reads and some of our meters are live, uh, we are able to run a number of reports to support uh, the figures that we're presenting to the management company or that we're billing out ourselves. How do you, uh, do you do, I'm just gonna call the reading and meters of someone else's meters, like the old retrofit meters of the 60s? We can read pretty much any meter on the market. Um, the meters that we run into a lot from the 60s and 70s, uh, we do have a number of those buildings and we are able to read them and service them as well. So if you have a building that had meters put in 1968, for example, um, we'd be able to come in, fix a few of them, some of them will not be able to be replaced or not be able to be fixed and then replace those over time. Now, can you have the old and the new blended together where you're only replacing the ones that aren't working into a new system and, and then expand it so you kind of do it over time? It may not make economic sense in some ways, but, uh, but can you do that? Yep, we actually just finished a property in Makiki where we uh, replaced six meters every quarter and so over the course of two years, we ended up replacing the entire property. But that was so the, uh, the association didn't have to eat the entire elephant at once, and they didn't have to go out to get a loan or get financing for the project. And in that project, were they going cold to metering, or were they have the old retrofit meters? They had, they had first generation meters. Uh, some meters were invented, and then a year later, this building had them put in. And are there systems out there where the meters can't be fixed and you can't read them that you have to do something else to figure out the bill? So a lot of the time those are proprietary systems and so those are uh, the meter manufacturer makes it so only they can read it so nobody else can read that system. So um, and when we run in those buildings there's nothing we can really do besides replacement. But then in buildings where the entire system needs to be replaced uh, we'll generally advocate either um, to re repair it on mass, replace it on mass, or to do uh, metered approximations. So those are educated best guesses on each individual's electric usage. What other surprise things have you found about what sub-metering has discovered or how it's helped an association beside the mere fact that maybe uh, owners use less electricity? Well, we had one property that they had two chillers in operation to feed all of their fan coil units. Uh, we found through the metering that one of the chillers was drawing an extreme amount of electricity from the property despite not actually being on. They turned the uh, chiller off and then they immediately started saving $10,000 a month. And so they were able to replace that after a year and it, this electrical savings paid for the new chiller.
But then we've also run into uh, and a condominium on Maui uh, where we found a marijuana grow house thanks to the electrical readings coming from the unit. And then we've also found fire hazards where there were uh, electrical outlets um, popping or exploding inside of drywall and we were able to find that in the electrical readings and then fix that before it set fire to the building. I think you were telling me when we were just talking a story uh, uh, about one case uh, when you submetered that you found that someone was illegally occupying a unit. Yeah, we found that too. Uh, that was a property on one of the outer islands where um, the owner only was here for about a month out of the year and then the way that their system worked is that they let security know that they're leaving so that way they can secure the unit. Then one of the security staff entered the unit and lived there for about 10 months uh, out of the year. But since, and then they switched metering to uh, us from their previous vendor. And then we were able to find that. We reported it to the owner. And then they were able to take legal action against the individual that had entered their unit illegally. So there's a lot of the technology today. It's just like everything else we see in technology. It's so far improved. You get lots of options, opportunity to uh, reduce your electric bill and have accurate readings mm -hmm. and, and it's somewhat fail safe to the extent the technology is allowing you to read this and see this even before the owner might notice there's a difference in, in all of that. What is the, is there any downside to submetering? Um, the downside is that the board might have to lower the maintenance fee once. Uh, once uh, you get the electric bills out, now you might be double charging, so you actually have to lower your maintenance fee uh, instead of increasing it for one year. Um, it's not really a downside, but sometimes uh, you'll have to increase the next year instead of um, keeping it at the lower rate. Yeah, I would have guessed the answer would be that if you have people and there's a bill, and that's a finite bill, mm -hmm. and you're now reading it, this guy's paying more and this guy's paying less, the guy who's paying more is going to say none of the meters work, you and know, because that common old meter or the average doesn't apply to him. But uh, with the technology and the backup you have, it's just the truth, and, and then they'll start adjusting their habits so that uh, they don't misuse all of this. And the way it works is it's always a board member. Is that right? Yep, it's always a board member. That's the one that has three or four air conditioners running in their unit, and so their meter read can't be accurate. Well, it's kind of logical, you know, if you aren't having to pay for it, people will just not turn them off when they go out shopping. They'll just let the things run because they get the same bill every month. And I'm not saying they do it intentionally or mm -hmm. viciously, but it's just out of pocket or out of mind. You know, they don't, they don't really think about it. So they just leave it on and, and they get that bill and they think they're using the right amount. They're getting charged the right amount, but they're not, you know, which is, a, is an issue. And then you'll see a lot, um, I see it on uh, Craigslist One ads for apartments that in master meter properties where you don't have tenants or owners paying for their bill, they'll actually advertise, we are not submetered. Uh, you can run the AC all day with the windows open and nobody will ever notice. Wow. And so that's actually something that's happening in a lot of properties and so that's driving their bills up. Well, we've been talking today with Tyra Law, of multifamily utility company about submetering. And they were one of the largest companies in the US as well as in Hawaii. And we appreciate all the wisdom you share with us about how that works. Our show next week, we're going to be following up on last week's show with the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission. Again, I want to wish you a happy holiday, and thank you for tuning in to Condo Insider. Aloha.